Well, welcome back, everyone. And um, we did warn you at the very start of today that it was going to be a packed day full of talks um, back to back. So apologies for those who haven't had the chance to go and grab a coffee, but we're going to move into our next session. Um, and look, the last session was always going to be a, a really tough one to follow and to control in terms of time with such a great um, panel of experts. Um, the conversation we just heard, I think, was was fascinating um, from some incredible local architects and planners and urban designers who were also joined by Emma Appleton from Homes Victoria and then Michael Maltzen. Um, it was great to have him join us live from LA. Some really important provocations and questions um, like how do we retain the best talent at Homes Victoria? I think everyone's acknowledged how incredible the big house and build is, but some really incredible talent there. We need to hold on to it and we need to support it and build around it. Andy Fergus made a plea to break open the straitjacket of our legally defined professionally accredited disciplines, something we've had a lot of conversations about. It was nice for him to plug the Merchant Builders book, which we, we've been working on tirelessly for the last couple of years and should be launched early next year. Importantly, I wanted to draw out a question that Tanya um, David um, posed in the chat, and it was a really important one about the fact that Victoria has a charter of human rights. However, housing is not included in this charter. And if it was included, do we think it would change the way successive governments addressed housing? Now, this is something, unfortunately, I don't think the panel got to, but maybe we can pick this up again later on in the day. We also heard about the challenges of building for everyone or building for no one. This was reiterated by Sophie Dryering at the end um, and something Kirsten talked about at the beginning. Um, post occupancy again, come up. This has come up again numerous times. And then Jeremy, I think, pointing out that architects design only 3% of housing and we need to be designing the 97%. Um, and importantly, we need to create an enabling culture across all of the systems affecting housing delivery. So an incredible two hours um, and some really important points there, I think, for the profession and importantly for government. Now, for anyone who did not see Michael Maltzen's talk earlier on in the day, that's now available and the recording is there. I'd encourage you all to check it out. Um, Michael's work provoked all sorts of conversations for us here in Australia. Um, in particular, I was struck by how difficult the sites were that he was working with. It provokes us, I think, to consider the potential of difficult and sometimes overlooked land parcels here in Melbourne. And as sites are becoming harder and harder to find, we will start to look more closely at surface car parking, possibly even Vic track land, um, the single story retail strip and um, was something that was highlighted by Michael um, and the air rights above it. And if you consider places like Sunshine or arguably all of the new 14 um, suburban rail link precincts, I think those typologies are really appropriate and something we should be really talking about. Now, in terms of this next session, we are turning our attention to London for the next 45 minutes and then to Berlin after that. Now, it really was an incredible stroke of luck that Karuzovic, Carson, architects were launching their new book, Public House and Works, today on the last day of the symposium. Now, the launch was streamed live at 4.30 this morning, um, our time. Um, it was evening in London. Um, rather than ask you all to go up so early, Paul Karuzovic kindly recorded the session as he was so keen to support the symposium. Paul is joined in the conversation by Pooja Agrawal, co-founder and chief executive officer of Public Practice, a really important organisation in the UK, to discuss a book that charts the last two decades of public house and design and de delivery in the UK, told through the studio's housing and master planning projects. Please enjoy, and I'll see you at the end of the session. Thank you. Good evening and a really, really warm welcome to everyone here tonight. I'm Pooja Agrawal, I am the CEO and co-founder of Public Practice and I'm here with Paul Karakusevich, the founder of Karakusevich Carson Architects and we are really, really excited to be here today to launch Public Housing Works. It's a brand new publication with Lund Humphreys and it's really about charting two decades of housing through key projects with councils and local authorities. So, um, Paul and I have a really shared passion uh, that we're going to kind of explore this evening. Both of us really care about the built environment for the public good, 
public practice is doing that through building capacity and skills in local authorities and obviously you're coming from it at a slightly yeah. different angle working with forward-thinking local authorities and really delivering ambitious high-quality housing so we're going to start with the book which is incredibly beautiful and really really interesting why start with the book why have you decided to publish a book for well after uh, thank you Pooja for the introduction um, after circa 20 years of the office, uh, really focusing on community housing, public housing, council housing. Um, we were approached by Lund Humphreys shortly after the uh, Mark Swanerton's uh, Cook's Camden publication, mm -hmm. three or four years ago, um, for us to write a monograph on the practice, talking about our uh, public work. Um, and we at the, t at the time, we obviously knew we could have made a very beautiful monograph, but we thought it would be more interesting at this moment to really focus on the process, uh, the history of the office, the process that we go through with each project, and then contextualise the projects with a series of essays and other uh, thought pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so it's taken uh, three years uh, to make. Uh, obviously, COVID happened in the middle which added um, some complexities to the mm -hmm. production, um, but it's been a, a real team effort. Uh, the whole office has been involved at various points and it charts um, 16 of the key projects of the studio and uh, going back circa 20 years to when we really started looking at uh, community and public housing in the very early days and other public, public projects. So I think that's what I thought was particularly interesting about this. It's not an obvious monograph as lots of mm. architectural practices do it really contextualizes itself within the broader political and social context of housing and so I guess I'd like to ask you about how you define public housing in this book I think it's it's a catch-all uh, title but uh, at the moment we're working for 16 uh, local uh, councils in London um, as well as the mayor's office and uh, a small uh, collection of housing associations. Um, this is mainly focusing on the work of the local authorities, mm -hmm. uh, so directly commissioned public housing works uh, for um, the council housing and the regeneration teams in those uh, local authorities, which we see as a really important strand of uh, housing production in the UK um, and and the work that we do with the residents and the work we do with our council clients for me is, is what makes it really really interesting. Absolutely and before we really really go into all of that I think it'll be really interesting for the audience to hear a little bit more about your history. The book kind of delves into that and why you just why you even took this path into public mm. housing. So it'll be yeah tell us it's a little bit a about very, a very long time, Pooja, <laughs> but um, uh, we had a, I was at the Royal College of Art doing my masters and we had a fabulous um, technical tutor and, and one of the design tutors, a uh, lovely guy called Tom Kay. And he'd been working with Neve Brown and the Camden Housing Department for many, many years and, and then they'd gone into teaching. And I think at the time housing was, especially public housing, was almost a non-subject. Uh, housing generally was deeply unfashionable. But Tom kept talking about the importance of really great, affordable council housing. And obviously with his experience in Camden, he used to take us on lots of tours through the, the Camden Estates, looking at uh, each of the projects and talking about the history and how each was developed. And one day, uh, we're sitting in the seventh or eighth floor of the RCA building and in walked this chap that people probably didn't realise, but it was Neve Brown. And we had um, two or three sessions with Neve over the subsequent weeks and months. And it was amazing, just, I think everyone had, you know, we knew the projects, we knew the imagery from uh, Alexander Rowe and others, but to sit with Neve, he must have been in his late 50s at the time, and I think that was really the spark. I was always, always really interested in designing public buildings, uh, thinking about opera houses, art galleries, museums, libraries, but I think the spark of, of the interest in affordable and public housing really came from those conversations with Tom and, and uh, Neve sort of talks to literally six or eight of us in the, in the RCA at the time. I actually had the pleasure of judging the Neve Brown Housing mm. Awards this year with Mark yes. um, and with David McHale and it was so interesting having that kind of 
joy to go and visit these buildings and architects showing this to you and, and talking about it. But part of the joy was actually spending time with Mark was, and, and David were incredibly inspiring. And we were talking about how in architecture school, housing was never seen as a typology that you study or do. It was very much the, the least interesting typology to yep. explore. Um, so it'll be interesting to, to hear from your point of view around how, yeah, what the attitudes to public housing were at that sort of early part of your career? It was almost a non-subject. And even now, several of our peers still think it's, it's very boring and uh, re repetitive. Um, and it's almost the younger generation coming through who see social housing as a really key part of the city and probably one of the most interesting sectors to work in. Um, back then, I think uh, obviously people have been a little bit scarred by the legacy of the public housing program from the 60s and 70s and by the late 70s obviously things were in the councils were starting to deteriorate because of uh, the Thatcher cuts and um, things started to obviously not go very well for those architectural departments and for the it's just seemed for the next 15 or 20 years people didn't talk about public work at all and so setting up the office in the, in the studio in the late 90s we realised no one was talking about public mm. housing especially and our very first office used to overlook um, two of the big Hackney housing estates and we realised everyone was talking about things like um, the Tate Modern and these you know funny little Swiss offices winning these competitions and we realised no one was talking about these huge housing estates that needed uh, improvements, intervention and there was even then a, a housing crisis because of the sort of dot dot com boom um, so we knew affordable housing was going to be critical and we started chatting to some of the local community housing associations and even um, then as a sort of very young studio knocking on the door of places like Hackney Council saying we've got ideas for mm. underutilized land we could do some affordable housing and I must admit at the time they thought we were completely deranged and that wouldn't they would never entertain doing any publicly commissioned housing um, obviously things started to change in the subsequent decade. So I imagine you said local authorities thought you were mad, but I imagine your peers also thought you were completely Com mad to completely. be working they, in public housing. A lot of people just, why don't you do some commercial buildings? Why don't you do fancy law offices? Why don't you do, um, you know, bits of Selfridges? And that was the, you know, posh, trendy bars in Shoreditch or record shop. And that was the, the staple um, types of projects for young studios. And it's fair to say good social housing is, is very, very simple. And, and um, if people just look at it quickly, they don't really see all of the detail and the complexity and the interest that can go into shaping those projects. And some people get it and others, others don't. Uh, but I think what's really exciting now is the whole plethora of young studios coming through, mm -hmm. and since some even not so young, uh, looking at the subject, which is, it, it used to feel a little bit lonely 10, mm -hmm. 15 years ago, and now there's lots of incredible studio setting up mm -hmm. and potential collaborators as well that we can work with in the future. So on that note, I guess, is that the narrative of how your first project started um, with uh, is a Clairedale in Tel Hamlet? We were extremely lucky and I don't know if Peter Exton is watching, uh, but we walked in, um, I think they were a little bit frustrated with some of their pre earlier projects. There was a newly formed community housing association on the sort of linked to um, Tower Hamlets Council. And I think the, they were a little bit frustrated that there was a lack of ambition coming forward in their uh, very small then um, development project, new, new build projects. And uh, we, I think we'd just come off the a run of three or four big open international competitions and somebody who'd been advising on those knew the housing association and they were feeling ter terribly sorry for us because we hadn't won a, a huge <laughs> international gallery competition or a library at that point and how oh, maybe you should do a little bit of you in, they just said oh, are you interested in doing some little community housing projects and we said oh, absolutely we've been entering european housing competitions and obviously we'd be really interested in. and we walked into a small interview a very informal interview uh, for four or five houses infilled mm -hmm. infill houses around the estate and we seemed to get on very well with the client group. 
Um, they like the work, they like the ambition, and uh, from that came projects like Clarendale Street mm -hmm. and other uh, infill projects uh, dotted around our hamlets. Mm -hmm. um, so that was probably, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and gradually those projects went through planning and eventually got built. Mm -hmm. So from Clarendale, which was about, I think, 77 dwellings, yep. to now <laughs> Colville, which is about... Hundreds, thousands, nine hundred. I think yeah, it's yeah, about 1,000 yeah, yeah. units. Yeah. So there's obviously been an incredible shift in terms of scale, and that's another really interesting thing about this book, that it looks at um, housing in terms of different scales. Mm. So um, how would you reflect on, on this sort of shift of scale? We've talked, touched on a little bit on the shift of yeah. attitude, but what else do you think you've seen shift in these 20 years in terms of perhaps your process of design? Um, I think the... the even in the very, very early projects, one of the key things was always talking to the residents on, on day one. Mm -hmm. um, from the projects uh, in and around Mans in the Mansfield Estate, uh, just to the east of where we are now, um, through to the Colville and the other Hackney Estate projects that we subsequent, subsequently worked on. Um, residents were absolutely front and central of the mm -hmm. of the process, um, which is not something that happened in the sixties. You I, th know, when I think it was th there was less, definitely less mm -hmm. engagement, and it was much then historically a much more top down process. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our projects are um, essentially ground up or resident led mm -hmm. with the council as a facilitator and obviously main client group, um, but the, the residents are absolutely key to, mm -hmm. to the process. And the scale um, for us is less important. For us, it's all about client ambition and uh, in a way what the residents on the estate um, are motivated by, what their aspirations and ambitions are for the, for the individual uh, projects. The, in the early days, there was almost no funding. Um, there was a little bit of cross-subsidy for the community housing projects. And in the early years of the council projects, there was um, some very early funding, I think, from Gordon Brown in the end of the sort of Blair Brown, um, Blair sort of government. There was some sort of a few million here and there to just mm -hmm. kickstart some council uh, projects. Um, I think our big break, uh, we were very lucky to win a competition in 2006, six seven that Gordon Brown initiated, mm -hmm. which was the, in a way the pioneering council house building program, uh, which was for barking, uh, council in East London and shortly after that um, some of the other boroughs started to look at their own development programs and building their own council housing directly rather than relying on mm. private sector development partners mm -hmm. and that went you know some of those projects were 20 or 30 homes some of them were two three hundred four hundred uh, home projects uh, shortly after that the global financial crisis happened and all of this uh, subsidy and the grant from central government was essentially mm -hmm. severed in 2008-9 and it took probably a year to two years for that to start trickling back down from um, number 11 Downing Street into the top of the councils mm -hmm. but the the even then the councils were still quite hum, hamstrung by how much or how little they could borrow and how much they could um, use their internal funding systems but what is really exciting is the the caliber and the ambition within the councils has really yeah. really changed and in the early days there may have been two or three people in the housing and regeneration teams um, trying to trying to get these projects off the ground mm -hmm. uh, with us and now there's probably 30 40 50 people in each of the council departments so mm -hmm. they've got much more great capacity great skills they're learning we're learning everyone is uh, the, the quality is 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 being lifted it would be really interesting to hear a little bit more um, specifically about particular clients that you have worked with. And I think that's what's really interesting about your practice and the work you do is you understand the complexity of politics, of funding, of the world that you're working mm. with. And I suppose that's what's quite interesting about you focusing on a very particular, you know, public mm. housing. So it will be, yeah, it will be nice to hear, mm. you know, you've worked a lot with Hackney, you're working yep. with Harringay. Like, I think, I know, I think make, in, the, life, in the early years, um, we did, with the project managers, have to get heavily involved in the funding conversations and the cross-subsidy mm -hmm. and trying to get the projects to, to move forward. We're very lucky now we can focus much more on the architecture. 
and the Amazing. engagement and the urban design and and with all, all our all public the practice associates. Of, of course, surely. obviously, of course. <laughs> uh, the, the so the, by the the council skilling up has made a tr tremendous uh, difference um, in that regard. So so moving forward, I think the we'll be absolutely design focused and the residents that we work with are, are so ambitious for how their either refurbished homes are going to look, how they're going to feel or how the refurbished building is going to look or how the new building is going to work and how their home is designed. Mm -hmm. So that is for us a really, really key, key, key driver. And is there a particular council at the moment that you think are testing or trying something um, Slightly I think they're all, it's 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 quite interesting because you would you would expect a, a homogenous sort of council mm -hmm. uh, standardised approach, but it's it's far from that. Um, each of them have their own processes and their own political mm -hmm. um, in a way the the drivers from from the politicians mm -hmm. coming down to the officers, uh, the needs of local people obviously factored in, and then also the condition of their existing housing stock. Mm -hmm. If it's great housing stock, then obviously it's much more about refurbishment and mm -hmm. infill where you can. Um, if the housing stock has deteriorated badly and the residents are really mm -hmm. do not like living there, then obviously we look at um, strategic and in infill demolition and, and rebuilding, because mm -hmm. that's what in a way the residents want. Uh, so, the, I mean, we're very lucky, you know, we've done 16, 17 local authorities at the moment, I mean, Hackney, one of our oldest, uh, longest standing, mm -hmm. regular client groups, and working on three major projects with them, and historically one or two smaller ones that are now finished. Um, but then there's newer boroughs like the London Borough of Brent, who have mm -hmm. really embraced uh, direct delivery uh, recently. Haringey, um, in the last uh, three years, mm -hmm. have really, again, gone from having a model which was um, arranged through joint ventures, now much more focused on, again, direct council-led mm -hmm. delivery right up until the point of detailed design, mm -hmm. tender, and then obviously working then with the building contract to deliver And it'll be project. interesting to, for everyone here to understand the what different types of scope, like what boundaries are you able to push when the local authority is actually taking that ownership of direct delivery? Uh, I think the... if. For us, direct delivery is really, it's so important to the overall quality because if, when the council stays in control, they are, have the whole, in a way they control the whole financial model. They own the land, you know, or 99% of the land normally for each, each project. Um, and with skilled up council officers and then the design teams working collaboratively, we can move the projects quite a long way with the highest level of quality, materiality, craft, specification, mm -hmm. generosity all the way through the project. There is, if, personal, my personal experience is, if private sector partners are in the room too early, obviously they're not there, they're not a charity, and therefore by them just being in the room, a certain element of value is in a way taken off the table mm -hmm. before, we, before we start. Um, and that's the sort of magic. I think that's the difference between the magic that a local authority can create through direct delivery and direct commissioning as opposed to a partnership model. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying partnerships don't have a place in some situations. Mm -hmm. um, super complex, you know, huge projects. Obviously, the local authorities do need partners for some of those projects. But in mid-scale projects, certainly at the moment, my experience is the local authorities have more than enough in-house skills um, with an occasional you know, expert brought in as and when needed, with a great design team, things, things move forward. Mm. And so far, very, very beautifully. And there's something here about, uh, I, there's actually two things I want to pick out on. One is around timing and the kind of time scales of that. Like with Colville, it, it feels like you're almost doing a kind of 20 year kind uh, of master epic. plan. Yes, absolutely. Slash delivery. And yeah. I guess that again is the opportunity of working with the client that has that stewardship of a place yeah. and, and it's it, sort of slowly it's evolving been, and designing this place. Um, almost 15 years since we started working directly for Hackney Council and it's fair to say early on the residents and Hackney were not getting on very well. We were then 
very, very young studio, um, compared to now especially. And we had obviously some experience, but we hadn't built a great deal at that point. Um, but we were able to, to come in and, and engage with the residents and work with what was then a fledgling council department. Um, and then within, I think, probably six, nine months of that process, um, a young officer, Karen Bark, came in and then things started to really, really change. And then uh, design officers, Rachel and others, were brought in to, to, to help steer the, the projects through urban design stages, through master planning, right down to the specification and the detail. So you talked about the importance of design and design quality, and it'll be nice to talk a little bit more about your material culture and mm -hmm. Has that evolved over 20 years? Has it not evolved? You know, where, how does your practice sort of explore that within the realms of working for the public sector? I think very early on, you know, in a way, brick was also, again, deeply unfashionable 18 to 20 years ago. And we, in our very, very early projects, we were trying to make buildings, given that some of the buildings we were taking down were only 35 or 40 years old, mm -hmm. some of the smaller ones. Um, which we thought was slightly ridiculous. You know, why are we doing that? Uh, and if we are going to replace them, let's make something that lasts forever. And so we did start looking at a much heavier weight um, range of materials, and whether it be really beautiful bricks, um, well-crafted precast concrete, precast panels, um, and other, you know, we've obviously at Clairedale Street, we used a very beautiful hand-laid, handmade uh, copper panel. Uh, so there's a, sort of a real range of crafts in the early projects, uh, craft sort of and, and techniques. I think over the last 15 years or so, I think we've definitely developed that. We're still using a lot of brick and we're still using a lot of precast concrete. Uh, we've investigated the use of cross-laminated timber many, many times. Uh, right now it's obviously very difficult. Uh, to use that. Um, mm -hmm. In the future, I think, obviously, every day in the office, big discussions over embodied carbon and mm -hmm. carbon content, and, uh, but then on the flip side to that, there's longevity and buildings that will age gracefully and buildings that are fit for purpose for the, for the residents. Mm -hmm. So there's a really just a fascinating discussion with, within the studio, but also with the, with the residents about materiality, quality, craft build quality mm -hmm. on site and, and seeing that all the way through. So I, I, I would say our, we try not to have an architectural style. Um, and I, each project sort of moves forward. Uh, there's sort of an innov in a, a gradual evolution rather than an innovation each time. And I, so there's a refinement of what is working well. And if things, if we hear from residents that things are maybe not working quite as well as we intended, mm -hmm. then the next project will look to refine that into mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. something else. So I think it's very, very gradual. And I think housing is such a slow, uh, going back to the earlier point, it's, it's, our projects can take 25 years from start to finish, um, hoping we're retained all the way through. Um, and so you see things that we were designing 10 to 15 years ago, and you can occasionally walk around and go, oh, okay, we won't do that again, which is, really fa is fascinating for us and 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 that can all feed into the next mm -hmm. phase or the next set of details or the next specification um, and we've recently been doing a lot of uh, post-occupation mm. evaluation That's with the residents and the clients and the, the maintenance people just to see how things are wearing um, and whether we got it right. I think that's it's so important and so interesting and often architects just do not get involved with the post-occupancy evaluation yeah. and from the local authority side they don't have money to be able to do that 10 years on or 20 years on because it's it's really deeply apolitical like why would you say yeah. that a building yeah. is not working yeah. well yeah. for example so really really interesting to see how you're feeding back and learning. I think there has to be that. an honesty and I think the, the, the some of the mistakes of the past from the councils were they weren't honest and then they also, for many multitude of reasons, the buildings were not as maintained as well as they should have been. There was obviously some construction mistakes as well, but the, they weren't maintained. And I think now, you know, one of the biggest things we can impart with our client groups is, you know, we can, we can design it, we can specify it, we can watch it being built and monitor it, but after that's finished, the client groups have to be responsible for the maintenance and management and just making sure if things break, 
they get fixed quickly. No, completely. And, and on that note, actually, I think working in social housing is, is deeply political. And one of the key things I suppose you have to navigate is around demolition and refurbishment and how do you work through that as a, as a mm. kind of architect working for a client who might already have quite sort of strong views about what might happen, but also linking this back to the kind of sustainability where in the mm. week of COP, like we can't not yep. think about that. Yep. So how do you navigate that? It's, I think every project we, we approach on an absolutely individual basis, depending on the quality of the existing building, mm -hmm. Uh, is it structurally stable? Mm -hmm. One. Mm -hmm. um, do the residents enjoy living there? Mm -hmm. Two. Uh, the cost of bringing that building up to uh, modern day living standards. Um, the amount of, for example, concrete frame and foundation that we're that is in the existing building. Um, the the type of space it takes up within the site. Is it placed? politely by the street or does it just straddle across a whole you know acres of land um, and and then we look at a can that building be refurbished beautifully and give it another 150 200 year lease of life um, if that's too expensive to do that and the gains are too short then and the benefits are too short and don't really provide cost um, you know value for money then Obviously, then we would look at, you know, creating replacement housing somewhere else. Those residents move into the new building, and then that site is reconfigured figured in the best way. To, you know, the the best housing, the best piece of city, mm -hmm. um, and m my experience at the moment is is most residents want either deep refurbishment, mm -hmm. everything to be incredible and completely refer like deep retrofit or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they want a brand new home That's and really it's and it's very you know when you're watching a, a new building on the other side of the street being built and it's all built to mm. you know essentially passive standards you know incredible detail beautiful quality of living spaces triple glazing it's very hard if you're living in a in a really old building next door that's maybe not been loved as much as it should have been and and then you're told oh, it's going to be eight years before you can re refurbish your building. That is a very hard conversation. Political conversation. And, and I think some councils have a brilliant track record of dealing with that in a very sensitive way. Obviously, there are some high-profile examples where that's maybe not being dealt with quite as well as it could have been historically. Mm -hmm. But it, I think the the mayor's uh, balloting process has mm -hmm. been really important in that in that regard. Um, I'm definitely for ballots and residents in a way working with the council to decide their own future of what their homes um, will be, whether it be new or re uh, new build or refurbishment. Um, I think there is a dilemma at the moment with cross laminated timber. Mm. We'd love to use it politically. It's very very hard. Yeah. Hopefully that will change. We love CLT uh, for low, medium, mid rise. It's absolutely suitable and we've used it several times mm -hmm. but politically it's uh it's very difficult the local politicians do not really want that at the moment hopefully that will that will change um and and you know with this week in glasgow there's you know a lot of potential for for that message to start coming through obviously paris uh, i think they're mandating 50 percent of their uh buildings all buildings i, I think also public buildings are uh, made from timber and are super, super mm -hmm. sustainable. Uh, and so I think we're in London, you know, almost all of our new projects are essentially passive house um, and very low energy requirements for the individual apartments, the individual homes. Uh, but there's obviously a legacy of embodied carbon in the frame, concrete and the brickwork. Yep. And that's, that, that's a, a, a real dilemma. Um, and so hopefully there'll be material research into concrete and, and brick in the future as to how that can be created in a, in a, a more sustainable way. Um, against that we weigh this sort of idea of a two to three hundred year lifespan for our, all of our new projects. So hopefully we can offset some of the short term carbon with the very long tail of, of the building in a, 
a usable life. No, that, yeah, no, that's really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to take some questions from the audience mm, now. There's quite quick. a few coming in. <laughs> um, yeah, and then come back to, okay. I've got a few more. I could talk for hours. Ooh. So the first question we have here is, do you have a favourite public housing project from any point in the history oh, that wow. you'd like to share? Yeah. Um, Where do you start? <laughs> oh, too, too many. Um, I think the work of um, Benson Forsyth was incredible in Camden. Um, there's so many beautiful examples in Vienna from mm. you know the last um, 110 years of the Viennese sort of housing mm -hmm. program. Um, You're gonna have to try and pick one and talk through it a little bit more. But why? Why is it? Like, has inspired your I work think, in a particular way? Or? I, th I think the types, uh, especially the Benson for yeah. house types and flat types, were really, mm -hmm. I think because they'd probably been practicing and training for, you know, 10 to 15 years with the, the old, slightly older generation of the Camden team, I think by the time they got to Branch Hill and others, mm -hmm. they were pretty adept. And it's, I think, some superb typologies in there. Um, it's probably not everyone's cup of tea, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we we are really interested in the sort of low mm -hmm. lower rise, mm -hmm. but middle to higher density mm -hmm. type. We think that's quite successful. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the the Edwardian housing, uh, late Victorian housing, as well as the, some of the early mansion blocks, mm -hmm. is incredible. Mm -hmm. I know I'm doing more than one. <laughs> uh, we're, we're 300 metres from the Boundary Estate. Yeah, I mean... Uh, sort of the, the London County Council's first uh, public housing project, um, which again is an epic... Uh, building affordable so housing at an epic scale. Yeah. And obviously it didn't quite go according to plan, but it's still an amazing, amazing piece of uh, housing architecture. Okay. So you touched on this a little bit, but which other countries or cities are doing public architecture well maybe today is there some um, places that you're kind i of think paris to? are getting a lot right mm, that's um, interesting. uh they've i think their model is being set up quite well they've got some very proficient public agencies delivering mm -hmm. for the city uh vienna i yeah, think I mean, are getting a lot right um and not some of the architecture is, is maybe not always quite my cup of tea, mm -hmm. but there are some beautiful either community-led co-housing projects there mm -hmm. that the city are facilitating yep. through quite creative procurement processes and selection processes for either co-housing groups, um, smaller community or socially minded developers. Um, and then I think one of the key things is just the affordability levels because they've been doing this for over 100 years. Um, you know, 60% of every sort of project is, is truly affordable. And there's, I think that that's a really, really important. Really interesting. Um, I'm going to take one more question, uh, which I quite like this one. So if you were the client, so you're sitting on the, the public mm. practice, the local authority side, with the brief for a large social housing project, what's the most important thing you would tell your architects? Um, to challenge and be really, really, really ambitious with the design and the quality of the, the overall design, the detailed design, the specification, and then the quality of the building on site as well. Mm, interesting. So I'm going to um, pick up maybe now sort of looking a bit more to the future. Mm. So we've been talking a lot about public housing. This is mm. what the book is about. But you sort of, at some point, talked about designing a piece of the city. So is it almost where we, is the future of housing almost not housing? Is it more about a sort of sense of mixed uses? Is, is, is that what you're sort of seeing perhaps in was um, the Selby project that you're starting to see a kind of mix of uses? Yeah, I mean, in, in the early years, the, the the need for just rebuilding or refurbishing bits of the housing estates that had obviously failed or were in desperate need of repair was there was that was the the only thing the council were thinking about and the and the the complexity of the 
in a way, the lack of finance the councils had at the time. Mm -hmm. There was immense pressure just to build housing. Mm -hmm. And one of the early observations, I would say, is we were building really good housing, but the ground floors were mm. maybe not as mixed as they could have been. And we, we did discuss this a lot with the clients at the time, thinking of maybe more community space, more retail, local retail workspace. And the clients would just every time just take, take, take them off the drawings, take them out of the financial model, because they were just a drag on mm -hmm. delivering the core objective of affordable housing. 10 to 15 years on, um, the, I think people are realizing that parts of the city that are mixed are really, really successful, mm -hmm. where there's local employment, local shops, uh, housing can easily coexist with that. Um, there's, and I think also by day and evening and night, having an active ground floor is also really mm -hmm. successful, especially when the buildings are a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you're making the streets and muses of townhouses, then it's quite nice to have a singular use, maybe with something on the corner. But where you're making big, bigger uh, blocks, we are now trying to, all the new projects coming through, I would try to have a real mix of use on the ground mm -hmm. floor. A bit of residential, mm -hmm. uh, some community, some civic. Mm -hmm. um, the Selby project, uh, which is a remarkable scheme in Haringey for Haringey mm -hmm. Council and the Selby Trust, uh, which is a remarkable charity. Uh, we're working on an idea of a whole new neighborhood, a whole new district called the Selby Urban Village, um, which is um, a series of uh, public spaces and pub, uh, affordable housing and the Selby Centre will be the focus of that neighbourhood uh, which is a, a mixed-use building for um, charity, workspace, civic, cultural use, um, all embedded in this new village. Uh, there's also going to be a new sports building, uh, sports hall and then this incredible new landscape with sport, amenity, fitness, mm -hmm. nature, ecology, um, and a beautiful new landscape running through. Um, so it's still, it's still um, just just before planning, sort of a quite a detailed, uh, lots of optioneering, working with the community groups, working with all the stakeholders at the Selby Trust uh, to try and get all of the their needs uh, incorporated into this remarkable new new building and and in the heart of this new new district. Mm, that sounds really, but really incredibly ambitious. And, and, and what's the kind of time scales for this? What's um, that looking like? We're hoping, planning early next year, uh, detailed design. I would hope uh, in a year from now we'll be mm. nearing uh, contract mm. and moving on to uh, delivery. Yeah, and uh, like we kind of touched on this earlier, it's like the, the time scales of these projects are quite long term, but that's yeah. also the beauty yeah. of it. And, and on that note, actually, one of the questions asked earlier was, um, what advice would you give younger practices embarking on public sector mm. work? Well, um, uh, I think stay incredibly focused to the cause. I think we are a 95% of our work for the, probably the last eight to 10 years has been public sector work. Mm -hmm. So one or two housing associations and then all council uh, projects. With, we've, we've often um, had one private client in the office at any one time. Um, and they've always been quite carefully selected and mm -hmm. um, which we've quite enjoyed from a, just a balance. So sort of maybe 10 to 15 public projects and then one, one private. Uh, now it's sort of one compared to about 25 public works. So I think we've been able to do the work we've been in making for the last um, you know, decade or so just because we're absolutely singly focused mm -hmm. on that sector. And by constant practice, com constant competitions, um, really pushing the design on each project and really understanding the subject, we've been I mean, it's, it's humbling that, and a great honour for the studio to be selected for the projects we're, we're working on. Uh, but it's not been easy. And it's, a, it's a, I would say, a minimum five to 10 year journey for a young studio to set up, start um, embracing a subject. Obviously, it doesn't have to be social housing. It'd be lots of other civically minded, community minded uh, types of projects, but there are a lot out there. And, and I think compared to 10 years ago, even there's, 
you see these great briefs popping out now that younger studios are going for, mm -hmm. and I'm really excited by that. Um, I think collaboration is key. Mm -hmm. I think in the early days, there weren't really opportunities to, to collaborate. Um, but I think two or three smaller offices collaborating together can win bigger, bigger projects. Um, so I think that that's really fundamental. And then uh, sometimes collaborating with larger studios. I think we've got probably at least 20 collaborators, um, quite small studios working with us on across a whole plethora of different mm -hmm. scales and projects at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly young architects and, and young um, urban designers and some people who are uh, landscape architects as well. So that's, um, for us again, really, I love that aspect of the job that we can work with the next generation coming through. Mm -hmm. And then just the final thing, this is obviously looking at the last 20 years of public housing and working with the public sector. So what, what do the next 20 years look like? Um, oh, wow. Uh, I wasn't expecting that question. Um, I think, I mean, some of the bigger projects are still on the drawing board. So there's a whole range of things we've you know, the multiple buildings still need to go to detailed design and contract and move through the site stages. So that can be five, six, seven year process. I think projects like King's Crescent um, will probably be hopefully finished in three or four years time. Mm -hmm. That will be one of the first big projects mm -hmm. that we can see the whole um, scheme come together, both the refurbishment, obviously with uh, Henley Halber and Rosen, um, and then the collective new build projects and um, the incredible public realm by uh, Muff. Um, so I think that that will be a really important moment. Um, we're very lucky. We've just been appointed to an incredible project in Toronto um, for a big, quite a challenging. Yeah. It, it was actually Canada's first housing estate, uh, Regent Park in Toronto. Um, so we're looking at uh, uh, the last two phases of that project um, it, it is again at a different scale in a North American really interesting. Uh, Canadian context and it's got some pretty serious <laughs> challenges but yeah. again a remarkable um, uh, city the Toronto community housing sort of a, an mm. arm of the city hall uh, who are the client group there um, and uh, we've uh, won a lovely project in France as well so, so we're basically really, it's about world domination. No, absolutely not. I think it's, it's, it's neat. I think the, 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 the first book we made um, four years ago, we met lots of interesting people through authoring the book and the research behind the book. That's led to some of the, actually the collaboration um, with the French project came, mm. that competition win was in collaboration with um, the Venier, Venier uh, Conejo uh, in, in Paris. Um, and in uh, the project in Toronto is also in collaboration with a local studio who we met through the research and, and talks after the book. So I think for me it's all about collaboration, um, design, great clients, client ambition. That's really what keeps keeps me keeps me going. Well, I'll be working. Whether I'll be here in twenty years or not, I don't. <laughs> I, I, well, only health well, will stop me. But, well, public practice will yeah. be working on the great client side and yes, ambition side. So, so. so great. I know you've got some thank yous. Oh thank yes, you. um, which I mustn't forget. Um, firstly, um, a really a huge thank you to London Humphreys. It's it's um, been a brilliant brilliant process. Uh, you know, thank you for reaching out and and uh, getting in touch to, to talk about the, the book and then being as supportive as any publisher uh, could be. It's, it's exquisite and we're delighted when the first... Um, no one wanted to put it down when the first copy uh, came through and um, it was sort of landed and uh, it's, it's got a, a lovely um, cotton uh, embossed uh, cover and some beautiful colours. Um, I mustn't forget uh, Violetta Boxhill who uh, Violetta and I used to hang out together at the Royal College of Art. Um, Violetta won't thank me for saying how long ago, but a very long time ago. Um, and a, a, a remarkable graphic designer, and she's very patiently uh, worked with us for the last, um, really the last 18 months, as we've been refining all of the drawings, the stories, the essays. Um, 
and, and then uh, she had the unenviable task of trying to format everything in a, in a legible uh, format, but it's, it's come out remarkably well. Um, huge thank you to Mike and Abigail um, for uh, sort of co-authoring and, and doing so many hard yards, as well as multiple day jobs. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and then a sort of a, a, a sort of a dedicated book team of uh, Drew, who's um, redrawn pretty much every single plan in the office over the last year wow. to uh, <laughs> in a publishable grade uh, drawing. So thanks, Drew. Um, and Sahana, and then all of the team members from the studio who've helped with essays, uh, research, and all of the beautiful work in there. Um, and uh, uh, KCA, uh, Karakus for Carson, collaborators, historical and present. Uh, I wouldn't be here now without you, and a huge thank you to all of you. And finally, uh, our superb client groups um, from uh, the distant history, but also current as well, a, a massive thank you. And uh, thank you for your belief and confidence in the abilities of the studio. And um, hopefully we can continue working together. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul. So enjoyable. And I'm sure we're going to continue the conversation now. Thank you to everyone for joining. I'm going to do a cheeky plug for public practice. We've been talking about public sector capacity and skills. So local authorities who are here today, please um, apply for uh, bringing talent to, and more capacity to your teams and, of course, uh, associates with urban design backgrounds or engineering backgrounds, infrastructure backgrounds. Please apply for our next round of recruitment. The book, it's out now. Um, it's really amazing. It's really interesting. Like we said earlier, it brings a kind of a really big political context of housing along with your work. And it's really, really inspiring for clients, architects, budding architects. So please, please, please um, get your hands on this. You can get it on the Lund Humphreys website. You can get it on the KCA website, on Instagram and in, on in bookshops. Uh, all good bookshops. All, it's always the good bookshops, yes, isn't it? Yes. It's the good bookshops. So thanks everyone again. And it's Diwali as well today. So happy Diwali, everyone. Great. It's a thank really you, great Pooja. day to Brilliant. launch the thank book. You. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, a huge thank you to Paul Karuzovic and uh, Pooja Agrawal for a fascinating journey through not only a book, but through the last two decades of public house and design and delivery in the UK. As, as Pooja pointed out, this is not simply a practice monograph, but it's a publication that positions the work in a broader social political context. And it was also great to hear Paul talk about how the practice emerged in the murky early 90s and when others were looking at the investment into cultural infrastructure. Um, with the support of the lottery funding that emerged, the practice was instead following the footsteps of people like Neve Brown and turning their attention inwards to the plight of neglected and stigmatised council estates. Um, importantly, the book is on its way to Melbourne School of Design. So for any students out there looking for a, um, an insight into it, it'll be with us shortly. Paul shipped these last week as soon as they arrived from the printers. And I want to say a huge thank you to the practice for staying up so late last night to edit and share the material for us um, so we could play it today. It's also great to know that Paul is collaborating with local architects here in Melbourne and I, I really look forward to seeing this work come to life in the coming months. Now, from London, we shift our attention to Berlin to hear about the incredible house, there's the statistic. Um, and I'll see you soon in the next session, starting in a couple of minutes. Thank you. <laughs>